I'm going to talk a little bit about epidemiology and correctional facilities because I do think it differs a fair amount from the community just so we're all kind of on the same page of the population we're talking about. A little bit about routine screening and corrections and how it's different than the community and then I'm going to focus mainly on harm reduction measures behind bars um, and then talk a little bit about how treatment as prevention plays out in corrections. So for epidemiology, so I'm sure most of you know Hep C clearly is much higher prevalence in corrections than in the community. Um, but there has been a meta-analysis of global detainees that estimates that about 26% zero prevalence in the general incarcerated population around the world, um, compared to the majority of countries that probably have a 1% to 2% prevalence in their general community. Um, and then if you isolate that out of people who identify as injection drug users, behind bars, those seroprevalence rates go up to about 64%, which gives us a, an estimate of a little bit over 2 million people incarcerated living with a positive hep C antibody. Um, as many of you have already pointed out, there really is no data out there related to actual um, chronic infection, and the reality is, is a lot of correctional facilities do not send RNAs in general, um, and the data is extremely lacking, as it is in a lot of these other marginalized populations. I think someone the other day talked about how much of budgets is dedicated towards collecting data, and I think part of the problem here is most correctional facilities have zero budgets for collecting data, um, and so therefore there's very little data out there. Um, the regions with highest prevalence were Central Asia and Australasia, although the regions with the largest population of incarcerated people with Hep C were North America and East and Southeast Asia. And as many of you probably know, I mean, the U.S. claims to be number one in a lot of things, but one thing we're definitely number one in is the number of people who are incarcerated. So in our country, Country, we have over 2 million people behind bars, and it's somewhat of a country within a country. Um, and the seroprevalence in the general community is about 1 to 2 percent. It's estimated that there is about a 17.4 percent seroprevalence in the incarcerated population, although the reality is, is that's based on a very small number of states. And so I'm not sure we truly know, but it ranges anywhere from about 10% all the way upwards to about 40%. Um, 20 to 55% of inmates have a history or a reported history of IV drug use. And in the United States, about 30% of hep C cases are thought to be behind bars. Um, as I already said, there is very little data. Part of the problem, though, when you really look at this population is so many of the behaviors that we so freely talk about in the community are against the rules, against the law, um, kind of not allowed to be talked about behind bars. And when that's the case, it's really hard to get accurate data about something that people don't really have or are not at liberty to truly discuss. So hep C incidence behind bars. So Australia reported that greater than 50% of inmates with a history of IV drug use consumed while in prison. Similarly, about 60% of inmates with a history of IV drug use injected while in Greek prisons. And although there's no data, the reality is it's probably very similar in the United States as well. Um, there was, is an observ observational cohort study in Spain that showed that hep C incidence was about 1.17 per 100 person years. And I think what's important is the factors that were associated with higher incidence were HIV co-infection, being in the early 1990s prior to implementing a prison needle exchange program and a methadone program. Um, and when you were an IV drug user not on methadone, um, you had a 11.5 uh, times higher prevalence rate than the general population and a five times higher prevalence rate compared to those IV drug users on methadone. So methadone very clearly decreased the incidence of hep C behind bars. 
So hep C screening, um, we've all talked about that the first step in tackling the epidemic is to identify cases. And I think it's been recognized by the WHO for a while that the incarcerated or previously incarcerated population is at increased risk for hep C and is highlighted as a group in their recommendations to screen. Um, the same is not true in the United States. And so the incarcerated population has not made it to the official CDC um, groups at risk. And right now, many countries, including the US, the recommendation is to test either based on risk behaviors or on um, birth cohort. Um, so we conducted in our system, um, soon to be published, but we had a poster for a retrospective cohort study to evaluate hep C screening strategies in our US state prison system. And kind of similar to what was discussed the other day, what you're looking at here in the graph with the different, uh, uh, on your right with the dark blue, basically is showing those cases that fell in categories based on their birth cohort. And what you can see there, or actually it doesn't really show up, but in the cohort from 1945 to 1965, the rates are much higher. The problem is, is even if you take IV drug use into account, about a third of cases fall outside that birth cohort, mainly because the age people get incarcerated often is a younger age compared to that birth cohort, so that the majority of people fall outside that age range, even though there's a higher prevalence within those birth years. So Similarly, in the turquoise and orange, what you're looking at is the um, prevalence in people who either self-reported drug use or came into prison for a um, drug-related crime. And what you can see here is it's about 50-50. So of the cases, only about 50% of them had a known history of drug use. And so when you combine those two together, if you use a targeting testing strategy, it misses about 35% of the cases. Oops, wrong way. So I wanted to focus a little bit about harm reduction programs, which is somewhat political and controversial as well. Um, but we'll talk about all of the different possibilities and I think more of a reality in some countries than others. Um, the one harm redu uh, reduction strategy we actually have in our prison system is peer education. So we developed Project SHIELD actually in conjunction with Michael Ninberg's organization in the community where we took an HIV prevention program that was specifically designed for active IV drug users in the community. And the idea here was is that we have had hep C and HIV education programs, but they're voluntary and it relies on people signing up and coming to learn about hep C. And what we kind of started to realize is those people that need the education the most are people that don't tend to come to those types of classes. And so this intervention, the idea was is that you take a small group of people who are interested in being teachers and learning and taking advantage of that fact to have them go back to their respective communities and do the teaching for us, in addition to the fact that they're probably better respected and better trusted than somebody who works for a prison system. And so we took this HIV program and we expanded it for hep C and we kind of designed it to be applicable to the correctional environment. And as I said, so it basically teaches kind of HIV and hepatitis 101. It also does a focus on risk reduction, which I'll show you in a minute, as well as fostering communication skills and actually gives the attendees homework to actually practice communicating with their peers each week. Um, the idea of risk reduction in general, particularly in US prison systems, is somewhat of a foreign concept. Um, and so this required meetings with superintendents and prison leaders to kind of talk about the reality, right? Is, um, I think part of the idea of prison is that we're curing people of drug use and the idea that we're actually talking about drug use is somewhat of a foreign concept. And so we literally um, use risk ladders that basically walks people through the safest, which whether it be tattooing, sex, or drugs, this is two out of the three risk ladders just to give you an idea, but kind of walks through the bottom rung is the safest practiced, 
whereas the top rung is the riskiest practice, but kind of walks people through um, where if you start off in the top rung, maybe you can get somebody to come down one or two rungs, but you may not get them to the bottom rung, but you potentially have improved their um, chances of getting infected or reinfected. So medication-assisted treatment. So by that, I mean using medications for people who have addiction issues um, and getting away from the idea of abstinence only. So I think that in several countries, including in the United States, we historically have always had an abstinence only philosophy for prison. And so why do we incarcerate drug users? So primarily, it's safety. Um, or that is the theory behind it. Um, and I think secondarily, it's based on this idea that incarceration leads to forced abstinence with then equals cure. And I think we all can agree that it doesn't really equal cure and that rates of relapse on, on opiates in particular post-incarceration is high regardless. So it doesn't really matter how long you're incarcerated for. That's still 70 to 80 percent of people relapse upon release. Um, despite that, there has been an extremely slow uptake of medications in the prison systems, um, primarily based on moral and philosophical grounds. Um, but countries like Spain, who have had methadone in their prisons for a long time, have shown that it leads to a lower incidence of hep C. And I think there needs to be a greater push around the world of getting these medications into correctional facilities, as well as upon release. Prison needle exchanges. So even talking about this in the United States would be completely out of the question, despite the fact that the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and WHO have advocated it for uh, needle and syringe exchanges for inmates for years. Um, but despite that, only 60 of the 10,000 prisons worldwide have launched programs. Switzerland was the first back in 1992. Um, I think we're all aware of them in the community, but this idea that they are inside a prison system that that is incarcerating people for drug use in the first place is kind of a juxtaposition of concepts. Um, despite that, Spain, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Moldova, Romania, Portugal, Luxembourg, all have had needle exchanges in at least one of their prisons. Um, and Germany closed their program, although it sounds like it was not for lack of efficacy, but more for political reasons. Um, but none of the programs have found that it leads to increased drug use, and there have been no negative unintended consequences. Um, you know, in corrections, we often deal with kind of strange ways of thinking all of the time, but the main concern for a lot of these things is that the needles are going to be used for weapons, and there really have not been any reports of that being the case. Prison tattoo parlors. So Canada kind of led, so the idea here is, is in prisons, tattoos also are against the rules, mainly because tattoos are associated with gang activity. And so there is a kind of default, you cannot get tattoos in prison. And um, there have been several studies that hep C is associated with tattooing in prison, not surprisingly. And Canada has about a 25% hep C prevalence. Um, but they were able to show that about 45% of inmates get unsterile tattoos while incarcerated. Um, so they decided to pilot a sterile tattooing program over one year. Um, and to kind of just talk about the benefits and how they differ compared to the community in that the obvious, right, it decreases transmission of HIV, viral hepatitis, and bacterial complications of using dirty needles. Um, but the other thing is, is this was really purported as something that really can increase somebody's work skills, is that you leave prison with a work portfolio to be able to get a job as a tattoo artist in the community. Um, and it also 
mandates regulation of tattoo content. And so what people chose of tattoos would have to be approved by the facility. Um, but unfortunately, that program got cut after the year in 2007, as it was called a waste of tax dollars and not demonstrably effective. Um, although a lot of people in the community argued that a year is really too short to show any benefits and changes in prevalence of bloodborne pathogens. I think the main reason it wound up closing is um, they only charged like $20 for a tattoo. Um, and so it wound up not being as economically beneficial as I think they thought it was going to be to balance the um, benefits of decreasing viral transmission, which I think was probably only a secondary um, incentive to start the program. Then lastly, condoms, things that we really don't, you know, it's kind of a given in the community. We don't even think of this as like a new thing. Um, they've been around a long time. In prison, however, these are still novel ideas. Um, so sex in corrections is not allowed in the majority of countries because it's really seen as a act of power as opposed to a consensual um, act. Um, and so it's usually forbidden in many um, facilities behind bars. And this, most of the recommendations and the known effectiveness of condoms obviously have historically focused on HIV and they have been um, recommended in prison systems. Um, given the data that we now know regarding sexual transmission of hep C among men, by extrapolation, I think condoms become an important part of hep C prevention as well. Um, and no show, studies have shown that infections can be prevented in prisons by condoms, but evidence that inmates use condoms to prevent infection when available. So there was a study in Georgia that basically looked at um, HIV incidents and interviewed people who became HIV positive during a 17 year um, time span for um, in their prison system. And during those interviews, a lot of the patients talked about using rubber gloves, using candy wrappers, using saran wrap, and using whatever was available to them to try to be safe because condoms were not readily accessible. Um, there has been evidence to show that the provision of condoms is feasible in a wide range of correctional settings. Um, and in California, they had recently done a study to kind of um, show their effectiveness in response to the governor asking to see the data before passing a bill. Um, but the Correctional Officers Union's response to the study was that safe sex for inmates means more risk for officers. And so the concerns in correctional systems are that condoms are a way of muling drugs. Condoms will be used for gassing officers, which basically means collecting an array of bodily fluids that are then thrown at officers, um, that they will be slingshotted at people. And the most bizarre argument is that it will decrease the ability to figure out when there are rape cases of who the perpetrators are. Um, and so um, we have very few correctional facilities in our country. There are a smattering of about two states and a couple of jails that allow for condoms inside of correctional facilities. Um, but the majority of uh, facilities do not allow them except for these um, special family visits that are approved. Um, this, Despite the fact that um, no prison system that allows condoms has reversed its policy or reported security problems or has had other major negative consequences as a result of condoms. Um, and what the data has shown, though, is that if you are going to supply them, they need to be easily accessible in various locations so that inmates don't have to ask for them and can get them without being seen. And so the study that they did in California, they kind of dispense condoms in several different ways. Um, and the one that was most successful was a vending machine in the clinic bathroom. I think that having to force someone to actually ask for condoms is definitely a huge barrier and having vending machines and things like that in more public places um, led to destruction of the vending machine. And so the clinic bathroom was both the most easily accessible as well as the um, 
most likely to last the longest. And then I'm going to end as treatment as prevention in corrections. So correctional medicine really is public health. And yet the priority for most correctional facilities is security. Um, and so many correctional facilities limit their role to medically necessary care. Um, and they prioritize patients for hepatitis with the most advanced disease to treat who they absolutely need to treat. And from a public health perspective, this often makes young, healthy individuals who are more likely to transmit the virus the least likely to get treated while incarcerated. And I think that if we truly want to attack this epidemic in correctional facilities, it really is gonna require a collaboration with correctional medicine and public health um, to kind of get rid of those silos so that the majority of people who are incarcerated can be treated. And I will end there.